so my name is Mandy Harris Williams, and I'm here joined with Nina Lorez Collins, who is the daughter of Kathleen Collins. Um, and so we're going to spend, uh, I guess, the next half hour speaking about um, the challenge. Oh, sorry, 20 minutes, that is. The next 20 minutes talking about the uh, challenges and triumphs of bringing your mom's work um, to more audiences, audiences like this. Um, and uh, I guess first I'd like to start off just because we're like still in it, um, telling you how I didn't tell you that I was going to talk about this. But I saw this movie on TV. Um, that Turner classic. Yeah. And when I saw it, I was so blown away because I was like, wait a minute. Like, I was so disoriented um, because first of all, I had never seen like a black woman scholar uh, as the protagonist of any film. <laughs> and then um, and then Duke comes in and I'm like, wait a minute, like, this is trippy. <laughs> um, and then just the, the depth with which uh, the black artistic and creative lifestyle is conveyed in the film um, is something that I just didn't anticipate could come from a film um, of that era. Um, I'm wondering, so let's, to stay in the aesthetics and the mindset of the film, what are some things that you see, um, kind of bits of your mom, her outlook, her well, artistic lifestyle? I feel like I should interrupt you and say, it's, it's the, the reason I restored the film yeah. was because of what you just said. Yeah. There was, um, so basically my mom made the film in 1982. I was 12, 13. Um, it was never distributed, as I said, when we, when we opened the movie. And then she died of breast cancer in 1988. And she had been sick for many years and had kept her illness a secret. And it was a big shock. I found out a couple weeks before she died that she was sick. And, uh, and you know, it was really traumatic. I was 19. I had a younger brother to take care of. There was no money. Um, and basically, I like put all her work in a trunk. She was a very prolific uh, playwright. She'd written short stories. Um, she was, if, if she was known for anything in her lifetime, it was as a playwright. She had had a couple plays produced. Um, one was workshopped at the Public Theater um, on, with Joe Papp, and you know, one was at like the Women's Project. So she was a little bit known, and she was certainly known in kind of the small world of black intellectuals. She taught film at City College in Manhattan, and she taught people like Julie Dash, who did Daughters of the Dust, and so like my the household was always full of kind of artists coming and going. But she really had had no real success. And uh, so I kind of um, put her work away in this big trunk, I mean, literally for like 20 years. And when I was in my late 30s, I started taking out her work and reading it and thinking about it. And um, around that time, I got a, a letter from this film lab called Do Art in Manhattan saying that they were going out of business and that they needed me to take these old uh, 32 millimeter reels. That was where she had mixed the film. And I was like, take them where? Like, what do you do with them? I mean, I didn't even know. I, I, it hadn't occurred to me that these things existed somewhere. I had an old VHS copy of the movie. And I spent like two years agonizing about whether to do it. It was really expensive. It was, there were two films. There's an earlier, shorter film. And it was gonna cost like $25,000. And there was just, there was no audience, right? There was no one who was interested in seeing these movies. So I was like, do I do this? Do I not do it? And I ultimately felt, well, partly like she was my mother and like it would just be wrong to let them disintegrate, but there was this young black um, professor at Yale, adjunct professor, who had been reaching out to me saying, I want a better copy of Losing Ground. I have this really shitty old version. And, and she said to me, when I show this film, the black women in my classes who see it start to cry because they've never seen any character in media like this. And that was really what convinced me to do it. I was like, I'll, you know, I'll just preserve it. And I still didn't know that any of this would happen. It was kind of a longer process. Um, um, I basically preserved them and then I found a distributor, this company, Milestone Films. I called Women in Film first because I come from book publishing and I asked around and I called this company called Women in Film and they were not interested at all. They basically hung up on me. And then I called Milestone, this company distributor that was known for uh, discovering <laughs> lost film. And they were interested. And so they basically took it on and they were like, now, and, and I thought my job was done. They were like, they'll make it into a DVD. It'll be available. I will have preserved it. 
Um, I had really no expectations beyond that. And then um, a couple years later, Lincoln Center called and they were putting on this film festival of independent black film in the late 80s, or I guess mid to late 80s. And um, they ended up choosing Losing Ground to be the cornerstone of the festival, which was a huge thrill. And I went and I, everyone in the movie I knew, you know, they were all in and out of our house and they were good friends of my mother. And to the people who were alive, I when called and we had this big premiere and I thought that it was like, it was so moving and um, kind of heartbreaking. Um, but it was really just the beginning. Then the New Yorker called her a genius and it went on to be this big thing and it's played all over the world and um, you know, it's on Turner Classic Movies. And, um, and then I ended up actually selling two of her books that had like literally been in a drawer and then in this trunk for 40 years. Um, because once the movie was successful, I was like, well, now people will probably be interested in hearing her voice. And I put together a collection of short stories called Whatever Happened to Interracial Love, um, which came out and did very well. And then last February, I did a book called Notes from a Black Woman's Diary, which is kind of a compilation. It's a couple of her plays, a couple screenplays, diary entries, letters, the script for Losing Ground, and another script actually called Summer Diary, which was just optioned by Issa Rae. So it's Congrats. been kind of amazing. So that's the story. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm curious, kind of, as you've um, ushered the film through, um, in as much as I'm like personally um, just kind of stunned by how unique it is. Uh, I'm wondering what are some of the interactions you've had as you've tried to move it through to different festivals? Um, what was it like in the earlier discussions with the distributors? What were some of the values or the virtues of the film that you noticed? Um, and how did they see kind of pitching it to festivals and beyond? You know, I think it's interesting to think about the reaction she had when she first finished it, because she did show it at a few festivals, and Ronald Gray, her um, partner and cinematographer, tells these stories about um, showing it and people really kind of saying, like, these aren't black people. Like, these aren't black people I've ever seen. And, you know, it was very painful for them. And all these years later, a lot of people think I've done some, like, extraordinary thing with her work, and, I mean, I... I it's, I'm glad I've been able to do it, and I, I know the business enough to kind of, but the truth is, it really was the moment for this work. It really wasn't anything I did. I mean, the movie is kind of amazing, and it's a real moment where people are interested in these kinds of st stories of black women, and um, you know, kind of the, the Me Too movement, and the, the whole culture we're in. Um, so, you know, I'd say the things that people, like you, the things that people really react to. I mean, first of all, it's just beautiful. Yeah. It's shot go really gorgeously. Um, and then I think the distinction of it being, um, of it being, as you say, the black female philosophy professor, this really unusual protagonist. Um, yeah, I hope you know what I mean when I say it's a, it's a good moment for that character. And I don't know if you've read Interracial Love, yeah. but it's, yeah, it's the same, um, it just really, it, it, it really is a strange experience. You know, there's the whole thing about, you know, artists die and no one cares about their work until however later. And this is really one of those examples and it's, it's eerie, but it does feel like she was making work that was really before its time. Yeah, I, uh, when I saw it, I kind of felt like, oh, like a seat at the table. Like, I felt like this is the moment now. Um, That's what felt... Elizabeth Alexander said in the foreword to racial, interracial love. Yeah. Um, I'm curious um, to talk a little bit about how uh, some of your mom's interests are kind of woven throughout the film. Um, there's this ongoing narrative about kind of like private and shared ecstasies. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak to some of her philosophies of life. How did she kind of um, explore that as you were growing up? Um, or ways that you saw that kind of influencing her? Experience. It's funny, I mean, you know, because I didn't know her as an equal, I'm not so good on the questions about her. When you said share her interests in the film, the thing that first comes to me is the psychic. There's that weird scene with the psychic, and she gave psychic readings and, you know, was really into kind of, um, yeah, she was very into weird supernatural stuff all the time throughout my childhood. 
uh, I'd say the, the ecstasy and the intellectualism, you know, she was a philosophy major and religion major, a double major at Skidmore. Um, and then she got a master's at the Sorbonne in French. Um, uh, I think that whole, the, the search for ecstasy in the film, I mean, the man, in real life, my father was white, she was married to a, an artist and had a terrible divorce very early on. And uh, I think it's all about that idea of, you know, can a woman be an intellectual? Can she pursue her art? How does it have to be physical? Where does it match up to kind of the masculinity, you know, of the painter in this case? Um, I think she was very, you can see in her written work also, very driven by the personal. I mean, one of the things that's really extraordinary about her work is, um, I mean, from the perspective, when you look at it in the context of race, like race exists in all of her work, but she's really telling the stories of women and their struggle with men and pain and sex. And those kind of come up more and more, even though race is always there and intellectualism is always there and creativity, they're really about like inner pain. Yeah, and, and very like intersectional, I think, in a way that maybe um, race films uh, didn't really express at that time. Um, and certainly, um, if, if there was a complexity to race films at that point, maybe not following a female protagonist. That's right, I agree. Then they might be more likely male. And that's yeah. what's kind of unusual. Okay? I gave a talk once at this, there's this great woman you may know, Gloria Dean, who runs this thing called uh, Well Read Black Girl. She's awesome, and she runs these, it's a black book club for women, and it started in New York, and it was really, it was right when Interracial Love came out, but it was really great to see these women were so excited to read a book where they could just talk about their inner lives, and it mm -hmm. didn't have to be about race, it didn't have to be about being black, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm curious, um, you know, as I, as I read your biography, and you, you've kind of, uh, supplied a lot of your mom's biography, so thank you, um, since we were a little shorter on time. Um, but I am curious about your biography, and um, I, I suppose the reason for that is um, I noticed that you have a degree from Columbia University in narrative medicine. And when I think about um, the experience of seeing this, and certainly seeing it in like this very, like, this is something I feel like I would see uh, I would see like a, a film festival like this, or like I, I can imagine there would be like some black women's programming that I would see it at. But I saw it so decontextualized, and because of that, it felt so normal, um, and it felt like a sort of narrative medicine. Um, I'm wondering about um, this is like a lofty, okay. lofty question. <laughs> um, I'm wondering how uh, the practice of reclaiming um, or redistributing or trying to give more life to your mom's work um, or even just kind of the moment that we're in now, right? We just had uh, Carrie James Marshall retrospective and we had the, uh, I, I can't, I'm blanking on the name now, but it was the all black women's retrospective that started at Brooklyn Museum and then went over to CAM. Um, and then we had Soul of a Nation that went tape and yeah, bam, and then, yeah, and then now it's at, um, now it's at the Broad. Um, but it's kind of this moment where we're uh, looking back um, and, and kind of getting a lot of strength, I think, from the, like these narratives that are just now being revealed, like uh, black creatives. Um, I'm wondering how, if, if at all, um, that kind of maps onto your practice and your study uh, around narrative medicine. Uh, well, so, so narrative medicine is a kind of like not really a field field. There's a master's program at Columbia. It's the only master's program in the country. Um, it's a little bit more recognized as a field actually in Europe. And it's kind of the study of how we talk about death and dying and how we tell the stories of our lives and our, our, our bodies kind of in the context of death and dying. And I did this master's after coming off of an 18 year career in publishing really because I was trying to think more about my mother's life and understand it. I've been working on a book for a long time about her, which I've actually just finished. And I wanted to kind of think about why she kept her illness a secret and what it was like for her to be trying to create so much work and having, you know, she was a single mom and two young kids and sick. Um, and uh, 
I think the la I did this in my mid 40s. I'm 50 now. I think the last 10 years for me has about has been about trying to make sense of her narrative and kind of ha where it separates from my own. Um, and I think it's been enormously helpful. This process of doing her, bringing her work out into the world and it coinciding with me surpassing the age she was when she died, she was 46, uh, I feel liberated in a lot of ways from her story, which I felt really defined me for a long, long time. And I don't know if it's one thing or the other. It was a, you know, it was a lot of things. Getting older, doing the narrative medicine program, spending 10 years writing a book. I'm like, a little sick of her now. I mean, I'm not. I love my, you know, but I, I. It took me a long time to separate a little bit from the story, and and that is what na narrative medicine is essentially about: using writing to heal and to figure out your own story, which is of course constantly evolving. Um, but yes, it's been a very interesting process. Awesome. We have five minutes. Um, Perhaps there are questions from the audience. Yeah. Was this your mom's first time directing a film? No, she, um, so let's see. So she started as a film editor and then started writing plays and stories and then got this job at City College in like 1974 teaching film editing. And then it was one of her students, Ronald Gray, who became her cinematographer, who kind of finally convinced her and said, like, let's make a movie ourselves. And they made a film called um, The Cruz Brothers and Miss Malloy, which was an adaptation of a short story written by Henry Roth, but not Call It Sleep Henry Roth, a different Henry Roth, who was an English professor at CUNY. And um, it's a kind of kooky story. It's about three Puerto Rican brothers and their father, their dead father is a ghost, and they're renovating the house of a really old woman who's dying, like this big, fancy house. And it's like a 50-minute film. It's also filmed and shot in Rockland County, just like this one is. Um, so that was her first film, but she didn't write it. I mean, she adapted it, but it wasn't her own material. So losing ground, is, you know, she wrote the script and directed and produced. Yes? So, how did you, as a, as a story editor, um, ultimately find a way to carve yourself out from this trajectory? Through, like with the narrative medicine, I'm just so curious. Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, I don't know if I'll ever really carve myself out of it. I, I just finished this book, and I've, I've written, a, I published a book last year that was about, I, I run a community, an online community for women over 40, so I have this other kind of second career that's happened, and I wrote a book about, like a funny, sexy book about aging, but I've been working on this memoir about my own life uh, for a long time, and it's a lot about my mother, and it's, um, we'll go out on submission soon, and we'll see if I sell it, and what happens to that book, and. I hope the writing of it and the completing of it is enough for me and that I feel, I mean, I'm very, very proud of what I've done for my mother and I've got four children, three daughters and a son and, you know, it's funny for them because they grew up knowing this sad story that their mother had lost, you know, I, I don't have a father, I, I, I grew up with this, this kind of weight of this dead mother but they didn't know really what she, you know, they kind of knew she was an artist, but it's been very interesting for them in the last five years for all of this to happen. So I'm like super proud of it. Um, but I also do feel like I, it's time for me to focus on myself. Great, it's great to hear. And I mean, really, and your name is kind of familiar, but maybe I'm not. Maybe that's not well, true. I'm okay. Um, yeah, 
it's amazing. I mean, at the, at the premiere at Lincoln Center, there were all these people like you. And they, I invited everyone I could think of, but then all these, you know, there were like 300 people there, most of whom I didn't know, and a lot of them, a lot of them were people like you, you know, who knew her or knew of her and were just couldn't believe this film was being shown. And um, so I'm glad to, to hear that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that perspective, and thanks to the others who asked questions. Um, Nina, we've got to wrap up, but I want to thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. Um, All of you. Yeah.